Starting out inside the 15, Thompson. He's going to launch it deep downfield, right in stride. Trey Palmer is gone. Touchdown, Nebraska. One play, 87 yards. All right, y'all, welcome back to Run the Damn Ball. This is your host, Daniel Magnuson. Uh, we're going to talk to some Husker football today for the first time in a couple months because we've been more focused on basketball lately. And I have uh, Landon Hostreiter here to join me. We're also, of course, going to be talking about uh, some March, March Madness that we've seen over the last two weekends. It's been a uh, really exciting, a lot of upsets, especially with the Final Four lineup that we have. It's all, you know, Cinderella-type teams, I guess, besides UConn, but... Um, you know, glad to have you on today, Landon. How's it going? Going good. Just kind of excited to be here. Kind of excited to talk about sports for the first time in a while. I know, right? I was thinking about it today, and I actually haven't had a podcast where I've talked about Husker football since I don't even know. I I just really have completely avoided it. I mean, I've talked about Matt Rule a little bit, but I haven't really talked much about it. So now with that spring football started a week ago, it's like nice to finally be back and be like, okay, there's stuff we can talk about. So, yeah. Anyway, wait, so are you, are you a junior at Nebraska right now? I'm a sophomore. You're a sophomore. Okay. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we can start off with, you know, March Madness stuff. I mean, as we mentioned, there's been a lot of upsets. Um, is there a single Final Four team that you like had going remotely far? Um, I had Miami going to the Elite Eight. I had them losing to Texas, and then I had UConn losing first round to Iona. I had FAU losing first round to Memphis, and then I had San Diego State losing to Alabama. So besides Miami going to Elite Eight, no, you. Oh, my, my bracket's in complete shambles. I had the championship being Memphis and Houston. So, and Memphis should have beat – that's the crazy thing. I actually want to go ahead and talk about FAU. Memphis should have beat FAU in round one. Absolutely, they should have. All it took was – I think FAU missed a free throw or something, and Memphis had the ball with like 10 seconds left. All they had to do was hold the ball, and they would shoot free throws, and they threw it away somehow. Yeah, yeah, it was – I had like – yeah, I had Memphis going to the Sweet 16 because I had him losing to Duke. And I was like, I was like screaming at my TV watching that game because it was just, it was just almost frustrating to watch. But it was also just one, it was a great game regardless of who mm-hmm. won. Memphis had the better team, but their chemistry seemed off. The whole it was game. very, it was very off. FAU played really together. And I kind of, like, I wanted, obviously, I wanted Fairleigh Dickinson to go far just because it's a 16 seed and yeah. But, they, I mean, they handled Tennessee really well. They handled Kansas State down the stretch really well. I mean, they've played together. They've been easily the best team in that region. Obviously, they won it, but easily the best team in that region. I think they have a shot at San Diego State, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think they do. San Diego State, I don't think it's crazy talented. They're just really tough. Like, every game they play, they're going to make it a little bit. Kind of how, like, Nebraska beat Creighton this year in basketball, which we'll talk about later, like, Nebraska just made it like a dirty game. Yeah. You made Creighton try to outshoot them and like they just took over. But, yeah. Um, San Diego State's so good defensively too. It's just they're all, it's, they're defensive. They're just so together. They just don't, they don't leave a hole. You have to, you have to find a shot that's a good, if it's a good shot, it's going to be either contested or you did something, you did something really right. Yeah. But okay. I want to actually, I want to talk about FAU before we jump to the Creighton San Diego State game. So FAU, so this is two weeks ago now, I think. But so uh, I live in Dallas now, and in Frisco, which is like 30 minutes from me, uh, they had the Conference USA, like men's and women's tournament. And then I ended up volunteering at that. And so I was like doing different things, whether it was on the court or helping with other stuff. Like, you know, they did it at the where the Cowboys practice. It's called the Star. And so – um, it was kind of cool because they had like two courts running at all times, whether it was men and women. It was just like constant basketball for like four days. 
But um, so I mean, Conference USA, the champion for the men's was FAU. Now uh, I got to see them play a couple times when I was there, and I knew that they would be tough. Like I was really tempted to have them go far in the tournament, but I really thought Memphis was going to be good. Then whatever. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, but watching FAU there, I knew they were a, like a really good team. They only lost three games all year. Um, they did well against the. I mean, they beat SEC teams in the pre in like the non conference. But um, the crazy thing is exactly what happened against Memphis, where they like should have lost, but they won. They they're lucky they made the tournament because they were playing Middle Tennessee. They they ended up winning their conference title game by a lot, but they played Middle Tennessee in the uh, Karma Two SA semifinals. And um, they they were up one. This is FAU is up one with like you know twenty seconds left, and Middle Tennessee has the ball last. And Middle Tennessee they have their post player drive down the lane, and then you know the big Russian guy for FAU? yeah yeah he fell over, and they didn't call anything. Like he just like kind of like flopped or something and fell over. And so this this big guy for at Middle Tennessee they're down one with like ten seconds left. He has a point blank layup. And he bonked it off the back of the rim. It came out, and then they didn't. They didn't end up scoring. And they lost. Oh my god! And so it was literally like that layup was. It was like that they couldn't. If they make that, I don't know if FAU makes the tournament. Yeah, it's it's not like the Big Ten where you can lose in the semifinal. Yeah, this is Conference USA. I mean, you got more more times than not, you got to win your conference to even get in. Yeah, they had to win that game to get in, and it was crazy because like I do think FAU is probably a top fifteen team in uh the tournament it was just that they played a real like middle tennessee played incredible and so they ended up almost winning but people don't people wouldn't know that that's part of their tournament journey but uh, it's wild that they got this far exactly i mean i picked memphis to beat fau simply because well i didn't like purdue as a one seed i didn't think they lose first Mm -hmm. round but i didn't like them as a one seed and i was like i think memphis can beat purdue but I don't know if FAU can. So then I picked Memphis and had them beating Purdue, but I didn't even account for the fact that Purdue wouldn't even get past the 16 seed. I know, dude. The Big Ten. Terrible. I've said this before. I've said this before like a month ago when, when we were talking about Nebraska basketball. Um, but the Big Ten, the style of play doesn't fit into March Madness. Whatsoever. It doesn't fit because it's all about structure. And March Madness is just not structural basketball. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of, like, chaos. Yeah, sometimes March Madness just comes down to who can hit the bigger shot. And that's all it is. That kind of happened again with the uh, Michigan State-Kansas State game, and it kind of bit Michigan State. I mean, there was a lot that went on in that game. It even went to overtime. But Michigan State probably had the more well-rounded team, but Kansas State just hit shots and – yeah, they're I can't remember out. how many assists Noel had. It was 19. Yeah, 19 assists. Some players probably don't even have that. Like, 19 assists. I bet there's players who, that's like half their season of assists. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's insane. Um, okay, so Creighton versus San Diego State. I watched part of this game. I watched like the second half of this game. Um, I know, like, we, I know we probably agree on the whole foul situation. Do we? I, I, I mean, I think – well, actually, I assume what you were going to think here. I think, it, like, it was by the rule a foul, but they never call that. Yeah. No, I think if you break it down – because I didn't watch the end of the game. I was working the Nebraska baseball game. And so I went and rewatched it right after. Well, I rewatched, like, the last 10, 15 minutes of the game. And I kind of saw it, and I was like, well, that yeah, it's a foul – but it's just almost like heart more heartbreaking that it was a foul that happened with 1.2 seconds left. And then it was called, it was just kind of a, I don't want to say it was unlucky because it was a foul, but, and I don't, I mean, I don't, we can get, we're, we'll get to this later, but I don't necessarily like Creighton, but I do. I mean, I'm just kind of like, damn, like it's just, it's just a bad situation to be in for them. Even the, like, cause like you said, that never gets called, but the one time it does is just the worst possible scenario for them. Just from a fan's perspective, you want to see the game be able to be played out longer. Cause it seemed like those two teams are so equal. So if they we were. come down to one call that really was like ticky tacky, that's just like, 
I feel bad for Creighton fans. I'm not like I wasn't necessarily rooting for them, and I'm not a hater either. I'm kind of like on the fan. I don't really care, but you know, it's just yeah, it's it's just tough. And I I don't know. It almost was like shoot. I feel like I was beefing with all the Husker fans last week too. We could get into that later, but seeing all the Nebraska fans just like rub it in that they lost, I was like. Y'all, we just look stupid. Like we, we just missed jealous. the NIT because we lost to Minnesota. Like we just look dumb. Like be happy that yeah. we beat Creighton in the regular season. Yeah. 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 I had Creighton going. I actually they were my national championship loser. Really? I had Creighton losing to Kansas, which Kansas. Whoa. We don't talk about Kansas. And because well, <laughs> I kind of when the bracket came out, I kind of looked at it and I was like, Creighton, if they want to make the final four, they have an easier road than most. I mean, NC State was okay. Baylor was – I liked Baylor, but they were all right. And then – well, I thought they were going to play Arizona. They played Princeton. And then it was really down to Alabama or San Diego State. And I'm looking at it now, Creighton shot 11% from three and lost by one. So, Well, that's really bad. I didn't even know that. Yeah, I did actually – the little meter thing on ESPN just popped up, and I was like, oh, that's really low. Damn. Um, I haven't even watched that much Miami. I didn't even really watch the game yesterday. I was hanging out with people. I watched um, their I watched their game against Indiana, and then Houston. And I didn't get to the. T- I was busy all day yesterday. Yeah. So I didn't get to see either of the games. I haven't gone back and watched that one yet. But everyone told me to trust James Larinaga, and I just never did. I think I had. Well, I I did up until the Elite Eight, and I was like, "There's no way they beat." I thought they'd lose to Texas by. 30. I thought Texas yeah. was really good, but okay. Yeah. The team that I'm most impressed by so far, I don't even think they've had a close game yet, unless I am, can't remember. But UConn, I mean, I thought this was Gonzaga's year. Like they hit that shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Drew Timmy's last year. They have so many good guards. Like they're just absolutely stacked, and they got blown out by UConn, like not even a contest. Yeah, UConn has been really like up and down this year like they started off I mean they beat Alabama by I think it was 15 I'm looking at the schedule I can't really do math but they beat Florida by 20 they beat Oregon by a buttload I don't even know how much and then they went to the Big East play lost to well beat Butler Georgetown Villanova then lost to Xavier Providence beat Creighton then lost to Marquette St. John's and Seton Hall all in a row and then have kind of just found it I guess again like I was really high on them to start the year, and then they got to the Big East, and I kind of ate my own words because I was like, this team's getting, like, bounced in the round of 32 or something, and then now I kind of look like an idiot for eating my own words because I was right the first time, I guess. Yeah. I would always – when I was picking games, I would look at how they, like, finished the season. I'd also look at, like, the ranked games. But I look how they finished the season. Like, if they lost their last three, like UConn, for instance, they didn't do well to close the regular season slash Big East tournament. So I was like, eh. Maybe they'll win one game. That's it, right? Yeah. And then they, I thought they Rick hot. Pitino was going to give them it. Yeah, I don't like him, so I didn't. I, I didn't pick Iota because of that. But I don't. I don't like him, but I, I know how he coaches basketball teams and know that he wins a lot of basketball games. So I was like, okay. UConn, I've been up and down with them. I'll just pick Iona, but they've been Who playing you, really well. Yeah, they have. Who do you have? I'm going to pick UConn to win it all just because I'm very impressed with how they killed Gonzaga. But uh, who do you think is going to win it all? I would. I won't agree with you. I'll go, I'll go away from UConn. I'm just going to say Miami then. I think if whoever wins that game is probably going to have a better chance than either San Diego State or FAU. If I had to FAU rank four and, teams, yeah, yeah. UConn, Miami, San Diego State, FAU. FAU and San Diego State will be a big battle because those teams have won so many close games to get to this point. Yeah. And so it's really like they're just kind of scrappy. I will say that one guard for FAU, he has really short hair. Uh, I can't. What's his name? Is it? You know what I'm talking about, though, right? Yeah. Is it John L. Davis? Is that John L. Davis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'm so, he's so good. I think he's one of the best players in the tournament for sure. How many but, close games has Miami had? Well, Texas was, they fought back against Texas. I know that. I didn't watch it, so I can't speak on that game, but 14 against Houston. 16 against Indiana and beat Drake by seven. Oh, the crazy thing is Drake, like, kind of – Drake blew a lead that game, too. Yeah, Drake had it for a while. Yeah. 
Forgot it about was, that. It was really back and forth, like, the entire game. And Drake had, like, an eight-point lead with, like, five minutes left, I think it was, something around there. And then, I guess, just Miami went Miami mode because they did it against Texas, too. Yeah, ACC teams, I, th- I mean, the Big 12 is the same way. I just feel like they can pop off at any time. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to watch. Okay, should we should we dive into the Twitter drama I got myself oh, into? Oh God. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was uh, that was just me scrolling in bed, like scrolling uh, through Twitter in bed because I hadn't been on it all day, and I'm like, "What is Daniel up to right now?" Because I'm uh, seeing like thirty quote tweets on just from random Husker accounts that I follow. People are coming after me, man. Okay, so this is what happened. So one of the Iowa accounts tweeted, and I actually agreed with what he tweeted for once. He said, um, looks like Nebraska fans are like obsessed with, have a weird obsession with Deion Sanders and can't stop like slandering his name, which I actually think is kind of true. Like I do see like our fans like really talk a lot of, about Deion here and there. And like, they're, they're I mean, look, Deion Sanders his personality is massive and he's definitely self-absorbed. So like, I get why people don't like him, but I like that. He's just a totally different thing when it turns in terms of like head coaches. And he's just a, his, he's very much his own person, even though he is a lot. And so I would, you know, I don't like Colorado football. I don't want to see them do well, but it's almost like in a way it would be nice to see them do well with Dion because I want to see him do well. I think he's unique. Uh, and uh, I like him, and in a way, it's like, yeah, they're Colorado, but they're really just Dion's team. Yeah, I couldn't even put that any better. Like, exactly like you said, like, I want Dion to do well. Now, the caveat of that is it comes with Colorado football doing well, and I don't want to see that, but so many guys, like you, every, every coach gets hired, and it happened with Scott Frost. It didn't really happen with Matt Rule, but they kind of just come in and say, we're going to change the culture and we're going to start winning games. But Dion's been, he's just been all over the place. And it's, it's fun to watch. I mean, yeah. it's just that it's Colorado and Colorado is getting all this attention from a, from a school that's, I don't even know how far Boulder is, eight hours-ish? Like seven. Seven, eight, yeah. yeah. It kind of sucks like that that's happening. But at the same time, like, I like as a Nebraska fan, I have I they, we used to be in the same conference, but after we played, I have no direct affiliation with Colorado. They could win the Pac-12 for all I care. Yeah, I mean, if they want to go eleven and one and win the Pac-12, but that loss is to Nebraska, sure, go ahead. That's, that's how I feel. Like, yes, when we play them, I hate them. Uh, I want us to kill them because it is it's just like Oklahoma in a way, or you know, if you played like Kansas State, you know, it it would mean a lot to the fans just because it's like, all right, we're playing again, but. I guess I'll say the, the tweet that I had, I commented and I said, if Colorado – or I said, if Dion beat Nebraska next year, I would be happy for him. I like him, which I'm not saying. I'm rooting for Colorado. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, genuinely, I would be somewhat happy for Dion because, like, that means that he's doing well at Colorado, which I would like to see him do well there, even though – like some people hate Colorado and that's fine. I don't really care about them besides when they play Nebraska. Obviously I want to see us kill them this year, but I can't lie. Like I would be happy for Dion. I just felt like being a little bit, I just felt like messing with people. And I did like, I got all these. Oh yeah. You, like, you definitely did. Unfollow, <laughs> like you're a fake fan, all this other stuff. And I just was like, that's fine. <laughs> like <laughs> That is his Nebraska is his first home game. Correct. Yeah. Colorado. So like, like you said, like, or like kind of I said before, like, I don't like Colorado football necessarily. Like, they used to be in Big 12. We used to play them every year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was seven years old, whatever. If he can go out and hypothetically beat TCU on the road, I'm looking at their schedule now, and then beat Nebraska at home and start 2-0, and I would definitely feel, like, happy for the guy. Yeah. Like, he came in here, he got all this media attention on his back. I mean, no matter if you – like college football, like Colorado, hate Colorado, you know, don't care about college football at all. You've probably heard some stuff that Dion's been saying. So there's a lot of pressure on Colorado this year. And this is a team that finished what? One and 11. And one and 11? Yeah. One and 11. Yeah. So, I mean, this isn't like 
and there's been transfers from all over coming in because it's Deion Sanders and there's been recruits coming in, but this is still the core of this team is still a team that finished one and 11. So kind of getting out and even winning those two games, as much as I don't want him to win. They will not games, beat TCU. I'd be shocked. Oh, I would too. But if he could put, let's say put up a fight against TCU and then maybe beat Nebraska. Not that I'm saying I want it to happen. I want Nebraska to beat him by 70. Yeah. And I don't, I want it to be 70 at halftime and just not let up. But yeah. if it were to happen, like, okay, I mean, at least he's kind of got, at least he's backing up what he's saying. He's not coming in here and doing all this talking and going two and 10. Like if they went to a bowl this year, I would be happy for them. As in like, I'm happy that what Dion's putting forth, if it was any other coach, I would be like, screw Colorado. I don't care. But I actually kind of like Dion. It's good for the sport of college football because we have more eyes on the game because that he brings that. It's great for college football, especially because yeah. Colorado, no one, if Deion Sanders was not there this year, no one's watching a Colorado game. No. Against, let's say, not Grand even against Tackle yeah most Oregon teams, State. Like, no, no I'm, one's watching. I'm that. personally not turning that game on. They could be playing like the only Friday night, you know, decent game. They could be playing like I don't know Arizona State. No one cares, right? No, and yeah. that's not like a shot at Colorado. It's just that I don't want to watch a one and eleven team on Friday in the in the middle of September just because it's a power five school and you know if both teams suck both teams suck you could say the same thing about Nebraska for the last couple of years that yeah. that last year when we played Rutgers I don't know how many people turned in tuned into that outside of Nebraska and New Jersey I don't, probably not a lot no yeah just because I mean to put it in hard words we sucked it's the way it works I mean, literally. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully we won't suck anymore because we just started spring football a week ago. Uh, Nebraska started. So um, we're now, I guess, a full week into spring ball. I know their spring game isn't for like another month. Well, like, I think it's the 22nd. Yeah. So they're going to be practicing for quite a while. Um, but I guess the big news of today, we'll start with the offense. I don't know. I have a whole lot to say about the defense today. Maybe. Maybe there'll be another podcast for that. But Anthony Grant uh, was not practicing last week. I think he had to get his grades or something figured out. But he's back on the field uh, practicing, which is huge because, you know, if he's healthy and we have a good O-line, I think he's like an 1,000-yard rusher. So um, that's big news. Now, um, you know, what are some big things that you've taken away from anything we've seen in, in the news with Nebraska? And also, I don't know if you know this or not, but is Casey Thompson practicing? Because I haven't been able to figure that out. The last I heard was in just a clip, I think, on Twitter of Rule, and he said that Casey's not cleared to throw yet, but I think that might have been, like, right at, like, the first day or two of spring practice. So you just jump five or so days ahead. I don't know. But the last I heard, he wasn't cleared to throw fully yet. Okay. Because he – I heard he, had like, had a torn ligament in his shoulder that he was playing with most of the year last year. That's Let's what I see. heard. That's Yeah, that's what I heard. Let's see what Twitter says anything. Because he was throwing – it's crazy to me that he had a torn ligament in his, in his shoulder because he was throwing, like, bombs against Iowa. And, you know, that's deep into the season. Um, But, yeah. Um, Yeah, Twitter doesn't have anything. Four days ago, he, he was doing some conditioning drills with other injured players, so. Yeah. And then – well, he was – well, I just see him do like a four-step drop in a video, so he didn't ever throw the ball, so I don't know. I bet they're they're probably saving him for the for the fall because yeah. um, that's what they – I mean, that's what they did, I think, a lot last year as well. I think he was pretty limited in the spring last year because he was coming off his Texas injury. Yep. Yeah, that's, yeah, so. that's what they did. I mean, that's why we went and got Jeff Sims because you never know if – you know, we're not going to have Casey out there just because he's battled injuries the last few years. Um, we'll probably see quite a bit of Sims in the spring game. Now, something that I've thought about, we'll, I guess we'll start with the QBs. Well, big thing I've noticed, it seemed like Heinrich Harburg was just completely neglected by the last staff. And, I mean, I always thought, I mean, if you're a six four quarterback who can run, which he is, you got to have some, like, you know, talent that can be developed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'd like to see what, what we can do with him. 
And I know that, did you see that triple option video with Heinrich Harburg? I, yep. I was actually just wa- rewatching it when I was scrolling through this Twitter thing. Yeah. I, I really like to see that. Um, so hopefully we can keep developing him because, you know, he's a Nebraska kid. Now, do you think we're going to have any quarterbacks transfer? Cause I do. I do. And well, at the start, at the end of the last season, I really thought Harburg was going to transfer, but now I kind of think that, He's in a situation not only with the staff, but also with a guy like Jeff Sims to just be there and kind of be more his play style, I guess, in a way. But I see you have here Smothers and Purdy. I think it is more than likely Smothers over Purdy, but I wouldn't be surprised if Purdy doesn't, Smothers doesn't, or both of them do. But I think, yeah, we definitely will. I I will say I almost think it's a lock in my head that Smothers leaves because not I mean Smothers is going to be I believe a this is his fourth year now in the program I think or third so this has got to be his fourth year I think hold on this is where we have Google yeah I know right uh, roster. Where is Logan Smothers? Can I just sort this by quarterback? Oh, yes, he does let me do that. Um, he was a class of 2020, so this is his fourth year, yeah. Did he play at all his first year? He did not. He redshirted in 2020, but he did play a little bit okay. in 2021. Okay, I was going to say, it just says of 2021 and 2022 on ESPN, but if he redshirted in 2020, then yeah. Yeah, so he's coming up on his fourth year, and, you know, we just brought in Jeff Sims, who's probably going to be – who's going to contend to be a starter this year and potentially next year. And it's like – I think Logan would probably do a lot better. I mean, he would do a lot better if he transferred somewhere else. I feel like he's just kind of buried here. And then I I even think Purdy is probably a better passer than Logan. And the only reason I would see Purdy potentially leaving is if he wants to find an offense that's more his style. Um, But – I think that I, I think Logan Smothers will for sure transfer in my opinion. I think so too. And then so Casey's gone after this year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Sims is gone after this year. Really? I guess I, guess I haven't really looked into Jeff Sims. I could Jeff be, Sims, I think, is a junior right now. He could he could have been a, like um yeah, he'll be coming in as a junior. So that's two well, years. This yeah, this will be his fourth year as a college quarterback, but he redshirted one year, so or maybe it's COVID. I don't know, but it says so, kind of changed everything. Yeah. So yeah, he has one more year, and then after that, it's well. Hopefully, there's another name coming in, but yeah. If not, it's probably those those three right now. Now it's pretty much who's going to come out of those three between Harburg, uh, Mothers, yeah. and Purdy. I think Harburg. They. I think the staff really likes him. And they even might even try to use him as like a wildcat or something if they – I don't know how that would work though. But – and Torres as well is kind of interesting yeah. because, I mean, he was a true freshman last year. Um, I don't know what their plans are with him. But he is a Texas guy, and I know Matt Rule likes to recruit a lot of Texas guys. So I think that's something that could help him stay. Oh, yeah. I, I think that he could be a kind of like sneaky – I mean, I'll say back up for now, but with the chance to grow into that starting role once those guys either if Smothers and Purdy both transfer sooner rather than later, but also I feel like he could wait and be a really good starting quarterback. His probably have to be his junior or senior year, depending on red shirts and stuff. Yeah, if he stuck it out. Yeah. I hope that we can keep uh... – because I do think with Anthony Grant now back in the fold, we got four good running backs. Um, I do worry a little bit about Ramir because he is undersized. Yeah, yeah, he is very Big Ten. But I, I think we have legitimately four good running backs coming in this year. So it's really just – I really don't have a whole lot to say. I hope they all – I hope that none of them transfer because if we get our O-line figured out, we could be really good on in the running attack. Yeah, I do like – now, I kind of have some bias, but Emmett Johnson, he was a freshman last year. He was Minnesota Mr. Football. Mm-hmm. I think he was a three-star. I've really liked – I've watched a lot of his highlight film from college, and I really think he could be a, like, sneaky guy come this – even this next year. 
Because I believe he did redshirt last year. I think it's kind of possible that Ramir could just get buried because if Gabe Irvin is – if Gabe Irvin and – uh, AJ Allen are both full health. Those guys are, are almost, uh, they're pretty much just as good as Anthony Grant. Uh, oh, I would say so, 100%. I don't know if they're, they're probably not as, I would say AJ Allen could potentially be the best one. Irvin's uh, more of just like a power guy, I think, if he's full health. But um, I, I feel like Ramir might get kind of buried on the depth chart like he did last year. And he may not even want to stay around because of that. And so then, you, you know, with, with yeah. that being said, I would see Emmett Johnson potentially uh, getting in the mix as well. I think he definitely could. But this running back room, there isn't like a – I mean, you have Anthony Grant, but there isn't that like all Big Ten first team guy. It's all just – it's really deep. I mean, you could go five, six deep in this running back room and be competent. Maybe, maybe not against some defenses, but against others, especially in Big Ten football, you could have – the five, six deep guys that you could send out there and just be, I mean, they could get three to four yards of carry, I think. Yeah, that's what we need really bad. Um, But, yeah, that's – I'm excited about the running backs this year. So, Xavier Betts being back is big. I, I, I did mention that a few weeks ago. But um, Xavier Betts, I mean, I feel like Marcus Washington and Xavier have similar body types. You know, they're like 6'3", athletic. Yep. Um, so, having both those guys – out wide is going to be massive for us. And then I haven't listed any other wide receivers out here, but, you know, Kemp, what's his first name? Marcus, I think. Or Billy Kemp is maybe his name. Wait, what? Who, who is Marcus Kemp that I'm thinking of? He's on, like, the Washington. He's on, like, the Commanders. Oh, shoot. Yeah, so this guy transferred in from Virginia. Yeah, it's Billy, Billy Kemp. Kemp. Billy Kemp, yep. Yeah, so he's a yeah. sixth-year senior. Um, Supposedly he's looking good as well. And – I will say I thought Alante Brown was going to be a top receiver for this this year, but he's not with the program anymore. Nope. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. But I feel like with the way that this roster is shaping up, tight ends are are just as important as our wide receivers this year. Oh, I definitely think that's kind of – I've had a couple of tweets about that where this tight end room is going to be really make or break for how well this offense moves it's at – at points now it's the big 10 you got to run the football always you got to have your little dink and dunk passes but this tight end room especially with the way they block and also the way they can catch the ball is really going to tell a story to how the season's going to go i think so they did something you know that they had all these position changes they announced last week now there was nothing i thought that was too big uh but there was one i thought was interesting so uh i think how you pronounce his first name is Jan Janiron Bonner Jan i don't know how to exactly I think it's Janarian Jan Janiron i don't Janiron. know that's the that's yeah. the only Janiron i've ever seen in my life so um Janiron Bonner he was a wide receiver last year two freshmen i think he was a four star out of high school as well but he's like uh he's going to be playing tight end as well this year so they said he'll, he'll be like a hybrid which i mean I thought last year, regardless of, you know, how things were at times, the one-two punch of, you know, Vokalek being the blocking tight end and then Brewington being, like, the – a lot of, like, the, you know, fake handoff, dump-off passes would go to Chancellor Brewington and they set up screens as well. He could be a player like that um, for Nebraska it's, it, this year as well. I mean, because um, I think Fedoni and Gilbert are really big. They're going to be they're, you know, every they're, down tight They're both end. really – like stocky builds. Yes. Like they both Fedoni looks like an NFL player. Gilbert, I mean, Bill Bush went on a radio show this week and he was coaching at LSU when Eric Gilbert was there. And, you know, Eric Gilbert, the, the transfer uh, from the SEC, who's now at Nebraska, of course. Uh, and he said, like, this guy's an NFL tight end. Like he's got the build. He's got to put it together. So, yeah. Yeah. But he's just, from what I've seen, he's, we got to worry more about off the field issues with him, but I think a lot of that from what I've seen has been corrected mm -hmm. to a, to some extent. So hopefully that keeps it up. Cause from what I've seen, I watched him a little bit in a 2020, I think it was, yeah, it was 2020. He was, he was just a monster out there, just a complete monster. Yeah, he was at LSU that year, 2020. He had a good year. Yes, he was. 
I just hope I know they're limiting Fedoni right now. They want him to be full health for August. And I think that's really smart because you just want this guy to make it to that point. Cause I think it's been back to back springs where he's tore his ACL, right? Yeah. And that's and, been tough. Yeah. You can't get any production out of him if he just is constantly on the sidelines. So just waiting there, making sure he's good to go 100%. It's going to be huge. It really will be. But as I was saying earlier, I mean, if we ever do two tight ends, it'd be really nice to have Bonner in there at times because you could do a lot of different play action stuff that could really work well. It just adds uh, a whole element to the offense, I think. It it's really a whole does. That really does, we don't have with Fedoni and Gilbert. Yeah, just like, like a speed guy. I mean, you're really hiding a wide receiver right there is what you're doing. Yeah. And then, boom, he, you know, you can do a wheel route, so many different things. But that'll be exciting. I know there was a big recruiting weekend, and I don't, I don't know about you, but getting into recruiting is like just so hit or miss. I, don't, I just try to avoid it. But every time, especially now, every time I look at like who's on a visit, who's interested in Nebraska, there's a list of thirty guys, and I couldn't tell you if that one guy was on there last week or not. Like I have no, I have no clue. Yeah, I, the only name I've really followed at all is of course Dylan Raiola, because like the whole, the whole fan base is following this, like. It would be crazy if he actually came to Nebraska, and I know he's considering it, but uh, he, himself and then a lot of other recruits were visiting last week. I did see one tweet that kind of uh, – I think it was someone interviewed Raiola about his visit, and I really – this was huge, but you know, Matt Rule told him, told Dylan, like, hey, we're going to win right now, and it's some other stuff that I didn't write down, but just, like, having the confidence of being like, hey, like, this is what we're going to do, and, like, if you want to be here, you can be here. So uh, I, I like to see that. Yeah, I saw one tweet. It was – I don't remember who it was from. I don't even know if it was somebody that I would even know. But I was just scrolling through Twitter, and I saw – I kind of agree with it. It was like if Riola on the off chance he could, he does commit here, we're not just bringing him in. We're going to bring other recruits. We're going to bring a program changer. We're going to bring a recruiting changer. Like it's a – it's – Obviously, it's a huge recruit. It's the number one quarterback in the country. I think in on three, he's like number nine nationally, and he's even higher on other sites. But I mean, he it's even it's bigger even beyond that. Like he's, if we could get him, this would be, it'd be the biggest recruit Nebraska's had in maybe ever. I don't yeah, know. maybe ever because the quarterback position is the most important position. So yeah. you could talk about you know. There were certain recruits. I think when Marlon Lucky, way back in the day when he came to Nebraska, he was considered like a Reggie Bush type recruit because he was like ranked that high. Yeah. But running backs only do so much. I know that like Christian McCaffrey had in other running backs that had huge years. But when your quarterback is a top 10 recruit, it's going to bring in wide receivers. It's going to yep. bring in all these other guys who want to come to Nebraska, not only because they want to come to Nebraska, but it's like a whole pro, like, as you said, you know. Yeah. Changes everything. And that's why we had so many visitors because they see Dylan one, might want to come here. They're like, oh, shoot, maybe me too. So, yeah. And I saw one thing. It was it was a tweet. It was a long time ago. It said, uh, a quarterback doesn't make a championship team, but it builds a championship team. Yeah. Like, I mean, oh, Dylan Raiola throwing to, you know, John Smith from Waterloo, Nebraska – isn't going to win any championships no, because no. that because you need a whole team. But Dylan Raiola bringing in guys with him, I mean, he's at Pinnacle High School. That's where I think Spencer Rattler went. I think so. I could be wrong, but I'm yeah, like 95% sure Rattler went there. So there's all sports, sorts of talent that comes through there. So bringing teammates with him, bringing other four stars with him that because of that appeal of, to him is going to be huge if he ends up in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're about to run out of time. Yep, I was kind of uh, watching it there. Yeah. But anyway, thanks for coming on. Uh, yep. Thanks, thanks y'all for listening. This has been Daniel Magnuson, Landon Hostrider. We're on the damn ball.